people in the science club or some of them are interested in science um, from Thomas Nelson Community College. We are at Hampton, Virginia. Um, we don't normally have you know, people in the field of science because we have uh, William and Mary, College of William and Mary close to us, but other oh, yeah. colleges, they're not good colleges. I mean, they're all good, but <laughs> other colleges, they're not that close. Um, so uh, I think today we would love to learn from you what you do at your lab. And if you can, if it's possible that you can, I don't know whether you have your notebook in front of you or it's a cell phone, if it's possible to show us your lab or to give us a little tour, but that's possible. We, we might be able to do a tour right now. There's some experiments that are being set up and it's a little bit of a, a zoo, but uh, maybe in a, a half hour or so, I'm gonna I'm look at my phone to see if I got a text from one of my lab mates and we might be able to head upstairs and see the lab, but that'd be really cool. Yes. Well, sounds great. Um, so we were just talking before uh, you joined us, we were just talking about you know, today, uh, the Nobel Prize winner having announced like, three scientists. Uh, the, did you hear the news? I did, yeah. Yeah? Uh, Lithium-ion batteries, right? Yeah, lithium-ion batteries, yeah. So um, um, what do you think of it? I guess, I don't know, okay, cause you, I mean, you got Kyle's question, I guess. I don't want to ask the question. <laughs> uh, what do I think of lithium-ion battery? I mean, they're everywhere. I know there's uh, one of the professors, I'm not sure where, do, do, actually, can you tell me? This is a question for y'all. I don't remember where they are professors. Uh, is one of them an MIT professor? Um, no, one of them is uh, from, from Texas. No, no, one of them is Japanese guy from Oconway. The other is the professor, the 97-year-old professor from oh. University of Texas. Uh, the third professor, I think, is from um, Brigham. Yes. Is that Brigham? Brigham University. Brigham University. Yes. yes. Oh, of course. Or Bingham, Binghamton, University of Binghamton. Binghamton, okay, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> British American Japanese is that where is uh, Binghamton in the U.S. I actually don't even know. Right, right. Yeah, one is uh, outside of the country. That's so well, uh, yeah, at least one of them is outside the country. I think that that's really cool. I think like so far this year, it seems like all of the prizes have been awarded to multi. Uh, national research efforts, which is something that's really exciting to see because a lot of the time it's just awarded to one lab or one specific um, professor and then there's not a lot of other recognition for a lot of the collaborative work that's done. So that's really cool. Um, in terms of the actual science, lithium ion batteries are a bit uh, outside of my realm of knowledge. I am an organic chemist. Um, I, I do I'll talk about this a little later. I do smog chemistry and atmospheric chemistry. Um, but my undergrad, I actually did chemical engineering. So I know a lot of people who have done um, battery work and battery development. And I know that that is a crazy difficult field. Uh, and right now it's very important for battery development to um, really explode and, and get a lot bigger uh, if we want to you know, fight climate change and prevent uh, increased fossil fuel use. So I think that this is a big signal from the Nobel Committee that they are really trying to push uh, environmental conscious projects. Uh, and I think they even said so in their statement. They said something like lithium ion batteries, which will help us um, get off fossil fuel dependency or something like that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I, um, I think it has become a trend that uh, every time for every prize, there are always like three scientists. Like I, I've seen threes quite often. Um, and like you said, most of the time, there's always a scientist from uh, outside the country. I mean, that Nobel Prize for sure doesn't have to be American, right? So, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so was, yeah. yeah. Um, I think we want to learn a little bit about your research. So you, stuck, uh, you study a smog formation, right? Yes. And smog has become, oh, don't you think like it's more frequent like in some countries, in India, in China, for example? Um, yeah, it's really re very dangerous <laughs> in a lot of parts of the world. And I'm very happy that we live uh, in the U.S. where we generally have pretty good air quality. Uh, I'm from California originally. I'm from... <laughs> San Francisco Bay Area. 
Uh, and so I, I feel very lucky because I have experienced the best weather and uh, the best air quality basically for my whole life. But now I live in Boston, uh, and it's it's a little different. Uh, it's definitely Boston's a lot. Boston's nice. <laughs> I live in Boston for no, Boston, years. Boston's um, very nice, but uh, yeah, the air quality is definitely a little little bit worse. So we have to study it a lot more and really um, increase our knowledge of this field so that we can understand how to prevent lots of death and disease from air pollution. Oh, the, so you also study the human health aspect of more uh, formation, or or a little bit, or. Not, no, not, 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 that, that's not so much my field um, because uh, right. that's like epidemiology. So there are whole bunches of people in our field uh, who will go out and they'll primarily go to places where there's really bad air quality, like you mentioned, India and China. Um, and they'll study the effects of air pollution on life expectancy or things like asthma or lung disease, cancer, stuff like that. Um, and that's a super important area of research, but that's definitely um, the next step after what my research focuses on, which is really the formation of uh, the smog itself. I see. So last year in California, there was a wildfire that lasted for uh, quite a long time. And the air quality in the entire, I mean, not entire, but you know, many parts of California has been very worrisome. Um, do you guys actually, I mean, did you guys, uh, was there one place that you guys uh, studied or? Yeah, the, actually that's a, a really interesting question um, because just, uh, I think it was two or three years ago, there was a, an entire field campaign. So a bunch of different labs, uh, different research groups will go to one specific location and they'll take all of their um, measurement devices, all of their instruments, and they'll just try to sample from the air and try to understand all the chemistry that's going on. And so they did this uh, in Montana. And there's actually the National Fire Lab in Montana. It's kind of cool where they just like, their whole job is to take debris from the forest or trees or whatever and burn it inside the lab. It's this gigantic space and they'll create a little fire and then they'll sample off of it and they'll try to understand the chemistry that goes on from forest fires. Um, and so that was just a few years ago, and there's been a lot of really interesting research that comes out about how uh, forest fires contribute to a lot of uh, negative health effects, a lot of smog. And then more recently, like you, you were just bringing up California last year, uh, and, you know, basically California is going to be on fire pretty much forever now, um, which is not necessarily a bad thing. California is a fire uh, ecology, so it, it needs fire to kind of clear out dead trees but it's really getting a lot worse than it ever has been. Um, and so some researchers actually took airplanes uh, and flew them all over California multiple times and sampled the air from the fires to try to understand what chemicals are in the air that are uh, being created from the combustion of all of these trees. And so I don't know anything about that research yet. Nothing has been published uh, as far as I know. Um, but I, I do know, like, I can tell you what my family experienced. Uh, they, you know, live in the Bay Area and uh, my sisters uh, are in high school and they actually had school canceled because of smoke. Um, and so I, you know, growing up, I never had a snow day. I never had school canceled because of weather and they had a smoke day. Um, and so it's, it can get pretty bad there now. Um, and, and so we, are on trying to understand what the health effects of that could be. <laughs> Sorry, someone entered the room. Um, uh, what the health effects uh, of the exposure to that um, burning could be, and then also what chemistry is going on from that burning. It's a very, very complicated, but frankly, very interesting and understudied area of science. Right. You said uh, school cancellation, that reminded me, um, just last year in particular, I think uh, many schools in Beijing, they were canceled for several days because of the uh, smog problems. Um, and also, since you were, you were talking about you know, California, how, the, how much cleaner the air in California is uh, than the air in Boston, I wonder whether that has something to do with the strict regulations of you know, the, the fuel efficiencies you know, of the cars and other things. Uh, California is almost like a separate country, right? They have their own laws and everything. Well, hopefully those uh, regulations will stay in place. Um, I, I don't want to, 
you know, get too overtly political uh, here, but our, my field of research is uh, obviously very affected by um, the political climate. Uh, the EPA is responsible for funding a lot of our research. And um, when, you know, currently the big news story, as you were talking about with the California regulations, is that the uh, Trump administration is trying to take away California's right to regulate its own vehicle emissions. Um, they, California tends to have much stricter vehicle emissions than uh, the rest of the country. And because California uh, is you know, about 15% of the total population of the country, uh, car manufacturers pretty much adhere to California standards instead of just uh, the overall US standard. So because California's air quality standards are much stricter, the rest of the country benefits from air quality because California is preventing vehicles from um, having um, uh, too many negative emissions. And so uh, California in the 1940s, uh, if you look at pictures of Los Angeles at that time, you'll see just like these gigantic clouds of smog. It's really terrible, horrible air quality. Um, and my dad grew up in LA uh, in the 60s and the 70s. And he remembers um, waking up in the morning and then looking out over LA and just seeing this disgusting, um, you know, cloud of uh, smoke and, and smog, this like kind of brownish haze mixture just hovering over the city. Uh, and so uh, around the 70s, California really got into this regulation. And now many parts of California have uh, the best air quality in the country. And there are some parts of California that are still really polluted, places uh, like LA because of the geography of LA and because there are just so many people who live in LA, it's really disgusting. Uh, oh, yeah, I see, sorry, question, yeah. Um, so the ecology of California is like less forested than a lot of areas? So California is actually, it's super forested. Um, if you look at uh, like the map of, of California, the northern half, like above San Francisco is, uh, and like, don't quote me on this because I'm not entirely 100% sure, but it is like vast, vast majority forest. Um, you, you get into the Sierra Nevada mountains, even on the coast, there's the redwood forests and all of that. Um, and, and in the north, closer to Oregon, it's really just entirely forested, super beautiful area, but it's also super dry. Um, there's not a lot of rainfall that happens in California, um, especially a few years ago, California was in drought for like right. seven years in a row, um, and there were water rationing, people, you know, were not allowed to water their lawns or anything like that. And so when it gets super dry like that, uh, it becomes a lot easier for forest fires to occur. And that normally happens in California. So California, um, there's uh, the cycle of, of fire burning down old forest to allow for new forest to grow. So when the forest burns down, the seeds that were dormant in the soil can, can then sprout up and uh, start new forest. And that's actually the natural uh, order of things. That's how it's been uh, going on for you know, hundreds, if not thousands and tens of thousands of years. But what's happening now uh, with climate change in particular is that California is seeing less rain than normal and temperatures are much higher than normal. And so that combination makes forest fires a lot more common and it's pushing things outside of the normal range of where they occur. So forest fires are getting a lot more common and a lot bigger and a lot more damaging. Right. So last year, I guess in paradise, a, a lot of people lost their homes and some people, I, I can't remember how many people were killed. I think some people were, were killed as well. Right? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Paradise, that is, that's a whole, that, that's not quite a, a natural occurrence though. Um, PG&E, which is the um, utilities company for California, they, they provide the electric and gas for, I think, pretty much everybody in the state. Um, they had an accident. So they actually caused the fire because uh, a, a downed electrical line. Yeah, it wasn't a natural start to the fire. Um, but uh, the natural dryness and lack of rain definitely made the fire worse than it would have been uh, if the climate were more normal and consistent. Okay, so um, since you're talking about, I, this morning on the news, I had that uh, BG and E actually um, turned off some uh, 
supply, power supply to some states just to avoid the wildfires for maybe two days? Yeah. yeah. So, um, what, how are you directing your research to the actual study of all these environmental issues? Small. Are you actually going to into the field to do the study? or to do you study in the lab? How do you do your research? How do you come up with results? Yeah, let me find a slide. So I have, I have a couple of, um, uh, here, I have this picture. I'm gonna try to share my screen. Let's see how this works. Okay, so can you guys see this now? Yes, we can, yep. Okay. So I simulate the atmosphere. <laughs> um, this is the, just from a collection of slides that I have uh, for like when I do talks and stuff like this. So, um, so you can see this guy in the backgrounds there in this like metal room. That's mm -hmm. Kevin. Uh, he's a, a former member of our lab. He actually, he just left. Um, uh, and this is where we simulate the atmosphere. So I don't go out into the field uh, and, and actually take these measurements. A lot of other people do, but um, not for me. Um, I stay in the lab and I actually create the atmosphere in this plastic bag. So mm -hmm. uh, you can see this kind of like, um, t it's, it, it's like plastic, it's Teflon actually. Uh, and then there's all these ports and stuff around it. So we inject different chemicals into this bag and we try to understand all of the chemistry that goes on just from this one, from one chemical at a time. So in the atmosphere, there are you know, hundreds of thousands, even you know, millions and millions and millions of different chemicals, and it gets really, really complicated uh, to, to try to understand. So my research uh, is really focused on uh, more um, uh, systematic chemical mechanism uh, measurements and understanding. So uh, the atmosphere, uh, if I, I, I hope I'm not overstating this, but uh, I, I think the atmosphere is the most complicated chemical system on Earth. Uh, mm -hmm. It is very, very difficult to measure things uh, in the gas phase, which is what we try to do. Um, and also from one molecule, so let's say we were talking about um, uh, cars earlier. So let's take gasoline, for example. Uh, if we inject one molecule of octane, which is in gasoline, into the chamber, after a few hours, that one molecule has the potential to turn into uh, something around uh, 10 million different molecules. Wow. So it's okay. very difficult to deconvolute all of that chemistry, and that's really what my research focuses on. But you guys were simulating the environment that's somewhat similar to what's actually happening um, in real life, right? So in other words, um, so is this the atmosphere that's more similar to the uh, near ground atmosphere or like, you know, uh, higher up or? Um, oh, yeah, this is, this is ground level. Ground level. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there's, um, can, there's you, can, you, yeah, can, you, can you also uh, tell what defines smog? What is smog? Like, you know, what we consider? Yeah, absolutely. Here, I got another slide. You guys are asking like all of the right prompting questions is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so let's see. Okay, so woo, all right, it worked. All right, I think you, you guys can see this, right? I'm going to talk about smog here. So there's a little picture of the car in the tree. Yep. Okay, cool. So what, um, what cars, uh, like the car represents humans and trees represent natural emissions. And it's important to study both of them because both of them have the potential to create smog. Um, so they emit primary gases, uh, which can be either, um, you know, burning products like from a forest fire, trees just actually emit chemicals. So like when you go outside and you smell a pine tree or something, and you yeah. smell the pine smell, that's actually a super important chemical that we study. Uh, it's called alpha pinene. And in certain places, like in the Great Smoky Mountains, uh, you might be able to see like a little blue haze or something yes. over the mountains. That's actually natural smog formation. Um, and that's something that we study a lot. So, so humans and nature emit these gases, and then in the atmosphere, they react with um, chemicals that we call oxidants. Mm -hmm. So ozone is one of them. You might 
know the ozone layer, uh, which is uh, way above us. It's in the stratosphere, so um, you know about 20 kilometers into the air. Um, that's not the ozone that we're talking about. That's the good ozone. This ozone that's in the grounds, like where we breathe, that's some really bad ozone. Ooh. They're the same molecule, but just ho humans and ozone do not mix well because ozone is very reactive. And so it will eat up your lung tissue. It'll eat up your eye tissue. Uh, it'll make you cough a lot and wheeze. It'll make you cry. That's not good ozone. Uh, that sounds but, terrible. Uh, if you don't mind I me mean, yeah. interrupting you, where's that bad ozone coming from? Yeah, so that's actually coming from car emissions. So um, there's there's a whole different uh, cycle of chemistry um, where uh, we have inorganic chemical reactions. So ozone, and then uh, if you've heard of NOx, N-O-X. Mm -hmm. uh, so NOx uh, is uh, a subset of chemicals, um, primarily nitrogen oxide and nitrogen dioxide, NO and NO2 those are um, incomplete combustion products. So in a, a car engine where you have a ton of uh, energy in the form of heat, you can actually rip apart um, the air. You can rip apart oxygen molecules and nitrogen molecules in the air uh, and form these um, other products, the NOx products. And those react with oxygen in the air to form ozone. So it's really from human emissions that we get all of this NOx that leads to ozone formation. And so actually sometimes you'll be able to see if you look at the weather, uh, especially in the summer, that um, the ozone level is really bad. Uh, the, the weather service sometimes puts out warnings for people with um, respiratory illnesses that they should not, they should try to limit their time outside. Um, and that's usually because when it's really hot, people run their air conditioning, people are driving a lot more instead of walking places. And so there's a lot more fossil fuel emissions that create this ozone, which has a really bad effect on human health. So that's where that ozone comes from. Mm -hmm. um, but that ozone is also very important for forming smog because it reacts with the primary gases that are emitted to form secondary gases. So these tend to be stickier um, they actually like to stick together with each other. And when they stick together with each other, they form little particles. Or they can stick onto existing particles in the atmosphere. And those particles are what we call smog. So smog is a, a mixture of the words smoke and fog, uh, which is kind of clever. Um, but it isn't really either of those things, actually. Um, it's really this complex like chemical soup that we're breathing in and living in. Um, and so we tend to want to minimize the amount of smog that's formed. So uh, my research focuses on this step from primary gases to secondary gases, and then secondary gases condensing and forming these particles. Um, and then we also care about uh, the reaction of those particles. So those can grow bigger, uh, or they can vaporize, they can kind of evaporate or rain uh, can, can get rid of them. So after rainy days, you might notice that the air feels a little cleaner. Uh, that's because the rain is actually cleaning the smog from the air. So uh, those, are, those are all very important things and that's, that's really what I study and that's what smog is. So, so if, if you uh, don't mind, uh, so smog might have you know, dust particles and bacteria attached to them as well, so it's, right? Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Smog can, yeah, exactly. There's like lots of bacteria up in the air. There's lots of pollen, lots of dust. Uh, and these gases, the secondary gases, can condense on all of those. Uh, and that can contribute to smog. And when they condense, you mean that they become solids, right? Uh, solids or liquids oh, okay. or glass. Okay. It, yeah, mm -hmm. it's unclear. They're just, they're not, um, they're not gases anymore. They are either like little liquid particles or, or little mixtures of solid and liquid particles, which uh -huh. is... That's actually another really interesting area of research right now because we don't really understand what state of matter uh, smog particles are in, and they they differ um, depending on environmental conditions. So, like in places like LA, they're probably more solid, but in places like um, southern India where it's really humid, all of that extra water content can actually make them liquid or black. Oh, yeah, sorry, I see you there. <laughs> I was going to ask, can smog make rain basically toxic before it hits the ground? Right. Is that city rain coming from smog? Is there... 
Oh, yeah. So those are, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, so acid rain is related to smog. Um, acid rain is, uh, like I was talking about NOx forming ozone, NOx can also react in the atmosphere. And, and also I should say SOx, so SOx, so sulfur compounds. Um, those are generally emitted from coal power plants. Um, so all of those compounds in the air can react with the oxidants and form acids. They can form sulfuric acid and they can form nitric acid. And then the rain uptakes those. And then when it rains on the ground, that's how we get acid rain. Um, when, when we're talking about uh, the smog particles getting rained out, it really depends on like what the concentration is. So in some places, um, and it's like, it's kind of gross uh, in, in some places like China um, where it's not so much smog, it's, it's a lot of soot. Um, after it rains, people notice this just like coating of soot everywhere. And that's because the rain took up all of the soot and the smog particles and just deposited them on the surfaces. So there's actually a member of my lab, she grew up in China and she, tell, she told me that when it rained when she was little, um, she would go outside and her parents wouldn't let her have any exposed skin or anything because when the rain hit it, it was like, uh, uh, it was essentially, you know, black water. It was, it was not clean water that was falling down. So that, it, it depends where you are, but it can be really bad. Do you measure smog or different seasons of the year? I, what was the first part? I didn't hear that. Sorry. Do you measure the smog? Do you um, yeah. you from different seasons of the year. So I guess oh. one, one season is pretty good more likely, right? Yeah, well, so, so there's actually, um, it, smog changes oh, from different seasons. Yeah, so, so let's talk about the summer first because it just ended and I, I wish it were coming back. Um, summer, summer tends to have really high levels of photochemical smog. So that's the smog that I was just talking about, where you have the gases reacting in the atmosphere. Um, that's because in order to have smog, you actually need sunlight, because sunlight um, triggers the reactions to occur. Uh, without the sunlight and the, the ultraviolet light, primarily from the sun, um, a lot of these reactions just don't happen. So the summer is generally a really bad time for smog. Spring and fall are, are pretty similar. Um, and then winter is, is different also. So winter is cold. Uh, and because it's cold, the layer of the atmosphere that we live in actually kind of shrinks down a little bit because cold air is uh, less dense. And so the cold or cold air is more dense, I'm sorry. And so it, it doesn't move as much. And so the, the atmosphere actually shrinks down a bit. And because the atmosphere is um, collapsing, it, it, not you know, collapsing on top of us, but it, it's just condensing a little bit. Um, that means that all of the emissions that we are pumping out into the atmosphere, they get more concentrated. So um, there are, I know in California, and I'm not sure if this is true in Virginia, but um, in California, there are um, spare the air days where uh, the Air Quality Board, which is a government organization, uh, really highly recommends that people carpool to work or don't drive at all. Uh, and those are primarily in the winter because if so many people are doing this and you know burning wood in their chimney and power plants are going uh, crazy in order to provide heat for houses, then all of that pollution gets really condensed. And so we don't see smog as much in the winter. What we see is smoke um, and soot. And that's a different problem, but it's just as serious. So Josh, I guess uh, um, that reminded me of what was happening in China, that they, they only allow the cars with, that ends with, the, uh, for example, auto numbers to go out on a certain day. Uh, on a different day, they would say, oh, only if your car plate uh, last one we had ends with the even number, you can go out. Yeah, yeah, that's... Uh... <laughs> your car, <laughs> no, no, it's really difficult to purchase a new car. You, in, in fact, you know, because, because of the problem, because of the smoke problem, because the city is already overcrowded with cars, yeah. I, oh yeah, I mean, I, so I've, I've definitely read in some places, especially wealthy people will own two cars with different license plates so that they can have one car to drive on each day. Um, and, and so that's a very extreme solution, 
uh, to mitigating air pollution, but in certain parts of China, like especially in the north uh, of China, where uh, like in Beijing, Beijing sits in a valley, and so the pollution kind of gets stuck in this valley. That's almost a necessary solution. So, so there's two ways to go about it, right? One of them is, well, there, I guess there's three ways. One of the ways is you don't do anything uh, and allow people to drive and allow pollution to get worse. And then people get sick and people, um, especially young people, elderly people, and people with uh, chronic diseases, they will suffer the most first. Um, and that's not a solution that I want to, to pursue. And that's not a solution China, China wants to. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I want us to go back to the simulation. Um, you said that you simulate the atmosphere in your lab. Um, what helps you determine what chemicals or the components of your simulation? Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's a, a really good question. Uh, and that, that gets into the, some of the fun stuff. So we have a lot of um, very complicated, very complex instruments in our lab that uh, measure um, all of the chemicals that are produced or as many chemicals as possible. Uh, and so the tools that we rely on are mass spectrometers mm -hmm. uh, and mass spectrometers um, take in uh, the, the chemicals, they zap them with high energy electrons, and then that, those electrons strip away other electrons in the molecule. And that leaves uh, the molecules that we're interested in, that leaves them um, ionized, they're, they're charged a little bit. And then we send them through a mass spectrometer that separates them by their masses. And it's super accurate, and it's so accurate that we can actually tell the exact number of carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, nitrogen atoms, oxygen atoms, et cetera, in every single molecule. Um, and so those instruments are, um, are very uh, accurate, but they uh, need to be interpreted uh, by humans. So uh, the, I, I, I always like to say that computers are really dumb. Computers are, are very stupid, and uh, we need to tell them exactly what to do, or else they're going to do something wrong. Right. And so that's really where uh, all of our chemistry and chemical knowledge uh, comes in, because we need to interpret what the instrument is giving out to us. Mm -hmm. um, so do you test how... Are you talking about, you know, there is this small problem, you know what's in the air, do you actually uh, intentionally introduce a new chemical to possibly the brain kind of destroy the smogs or is, is there part uh -oh. of the research? Or? That is, um, <laughs> that's a really interesting um, field of research. <laughs> do you uh, it, right? well, it, yeah, exactly. It's really controversial. Um, and so there are a lot of, there are, okay, I, I don't want to say there are a lot of, but there are significant uh, numbers of research groups that are looking into geoengineering. So what geoengineering is, is exactly what you were talking about, which is deliberately introducing something else into the uh, environment in order to change something that is currently happening. And so what people are mostly talking about geoengineering is to combat climate change by injecting uh, smog particles, basically smog particles. They're actually microscopic droplets of sulfuric acid. Uh, they want to inject those particles into the stratosphere to act as like a cloud layer to block sunlight from coming to the earth. So that's what geoengineering is, is mostly talked about these days. Some people have discussed what you just brought up, which is injecting other chemicals into the air to try to stop smog formation. And that is really hard at this point in time because um, you might think that we understand smog pretty well and, and we do, but we don't understand it that well to be able to do something like that without potentially really messing things up. 
Um, and, and actually, right now, the UN um, has a ban on all environmental experience, experiments like that. Um, and every, it, it's kind of sad that every country in the world has signed on to that agreement except for the U.S. Um, and, and that's, um, I think, a big problem. Um, and that's my personal opinion. Uh, but I, I think that to inject something into the atmosphere um, without being able to really predict with, with high accuracy and high precision um, what it's going to do is, is pretty dangerous. Yeah. Doing it in a controlled environment like the one that you have, though, is that like much less risky? It would be. Yeah. No. Totally. So there are uh, plans. I think, uh, and again, don't quote me on that because uh, I'm just a grad student, right? I'm not in charge of this research, but um, there are plans to do chamber experiments that really focus on. Um, preventative treatment. And the challenge with doing that is that in the chamber, it's already very difficult to just understand uh, one chemical, uh, one chemical's total reaction pathway. To do that with the atmosphere where there are, you know, like I said, millions and millions of different chemicals, it is um, a monumental task. And and, and so I, I know right now at the um, at CERN, the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, um, there are experiments going on on cloud formation um, in in the gigantic chamber that they have there. So they're injecting different chemicals into the uh, big chamber. They're turning on um, uh, a, a, an electron beam essentially from the Large Hadron Collider, and they're trying to create clouds. And I think what they're also trying to do is understand what uh, allows clouds to form and what prevents clouds from forming. And part of that is uh, an effort to prevent smog formation as well. So it's in the baby steps of research right now, but, you know, hopefully in 10, 20 years, we might, we might be able to understand that. Wow. Um, I also want to ask, you know, I guess, how, can you talk a little bit about how smog travel? Because I understand that, you know, different places probably have their micro environment. Um, smog, the smog in one city must be different from the smog from another place. Right? Um. Yeah, it, it's really true. There are, um, there was a big study uh, where um, my, uh, someone in my old lab, so I, I went to UC Berkeley for my undergrad, um, and someone there went all around the world with uh, one of these mass spectrometer instruments. Uh, this, it's an uh, aerosol mass spectrometer is what it's called, and it measures specifically the particles, the smog particles. Um, she went all around the world uh, and collected different smog particles from different countries, different places, and they're super different uh, across the world. So you go to somewhere like uh, California and it's it, you know pretty evenly divided between like um, car combustion products and natural emissions. You go to the Amazon and in the Amazon rainforest, it's super dominated by uh, natural emissions. And you go to China and it's really sooty. Um, you go to somewhere like uh, Northern Europe and uh, it, it's a really interesting mix of like sea salt and, uh, and organic compounds. So it is very different depending on where you are. Um, and that's because smog formation is, is pretty localized, but smog can actually travel from even from like China all the way to California. Mm -hmm. How do you collect uh, smog down in the field? Oh, yeah. So there are a lot of different ways to do that. Um, one of the, well, I, it, so the best way, in my opinion, is to take your instrument out into the field and uh, actually collect it directly. So you just kind of open the inlet to the instrument and sample the air directly. In. Vacuum, like suck in the air or something? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mass spectrometers have to, um, they, they operate at a vacuum that's actually, um, I think, roughly as strong, uh, uh, not, not quite as strong, but it's almost the same as the vacuum of space. So um, the, the air is just, it, it will naturally go into the instrument uh, by vacuum suction. Um, so, so that's the best way to do it, but there are other ways to do it uh, where, let's say, you want to collect samples from uh, Siberia. Okay, I'm not going to go live in Siberia for three months. <laughs> I don't know if you want to do that, but that's not my cup of tea. Uh, and so what you can do is you can set up uh, a device to collect particles 
onto uh, filters. So the filters are uh, similar to like, sort of like a coffee filter. Coffee filters allow some particles to get through. They allow water to get through, but they'll trap the coffee grounds. And the filters that we're talking about are much um, finer. So coffee filters uh, allow pretty big particles to get through. The filters that we're talking about only allow particles that are smaller than something like 250 nanometers uh, to get through. So think about particles that are like 100 times smaller than the diameter of one of your hairs. Uh, those are the ones that can get through, but all of the other particles are trapped on the filter. And then you can go back to Siberia, collect your filters, and then bring them to your lab and then extract them into some solution like water or, uh, or um, some other sort of solvent and then analyze the, um, the particles that way. So I guess you can figure out the density by dividing the time that the filter has been sitting there. Um, like that. Exactly, yeah, you can pretty much, yeah, you can tell exactly how, uh, what the average concentration of smog was at, uh, at, at the time that it was collecting, exactly. I want to ask you, uh, what, what are the size ranges for this uh, smog? So like, you know, I know that in China, they talk about PM 2.5, PM 10. Everybody's oh, yeah. wearing a mask you know, that has been decorated with you know, these funny um, you know, animal faces. Um, yeah, <laughs> let, me, let me hear you. Look, another slide, bam. So, um, so PM, right? So, uh, okay, so PM 2.5 you brought up and PM 10. So that stands for particulate matter 2.5 micrometers in diameter or less. So uh, like I said, a human hair is like 50 to 70 micrometers or microns in diameter. The particles that we mostly care about are the little pink ones uh, here, so PM 2.5. Those are the particles that have been shown to be able to get into your lungs and stay in your lungs. Um, and those are the really dangerous ones. Did I see someone's hand raise? I'm sorry. No. OK, cool. Sorry, I y'all are just minimized a little bit in my screen right now. I'm just looking at the slides like you. Um, and, and so those particles, um, it's actually not fully clear how those particles are um, uh, causing negative health effects. What we do know is that as the particle concentration increases, Mm -hmm. Diseases like lung cancer, strokes, um, COPD, those all increase uh, with, with those particles. And it's thought that the particles themselves mm -hmm. induce some sort of a stress on your living tissue uh, that can lead to DNA damage. Mm -hmm. so you mentioned COPD. I just want to make sure that everybody knows what COPD is. Cardi Cardiovascular, pulmonary, or chronic obstructive, obstructive pulmonary disease. This is a basic lung, your heart. Yeah. It's yeah, just... exactly. So, so you'll, yeah, it, it's something that you, you won't be able to do exercise. It's it's similar, I think, to asthma, but it's it's not quite. Um, there's no trigger for it. Uh, it, it it's just something that uh, can occur on its own instead of having to be in like. For asthma, you tend to have to be in a smoggy area or have to be running or something. COPD is, uh, I believe, a little bit more severe. Mm -hmm. So um, all these results that you are accumulating, how do you intend to use it to change the world? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if Same, the earth. Yeah. Affecting people's health. There should be a plan to push your results into the right places to make it oh, change yeah. the world. Absolutely. I mean, so that's like, that is the ultimate end goal, right? Is that eventually all of, all of our work will be pushing primarily uh, policy, public policy. So convincing politicians, convincing regulatory agencies that what, uh, what needs to be done to help humanity, you know, essentially um, reduce air pollution, prevent climate change from getting worse, uh, all of that. So right now, what, what we do is we primarily present to other scientists uh, and, and that leaves us with an unfortunate gap, I think, in who cares about our research. So, 
one of the reasons why I love, you know, having these talks like with people like you guys is that I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if like you guys would have um, been exposed to smog chemistry before. I wasn't exposed to smog chemistry until the very end of college for me. Um, and I didn't really know how bad it was in a lot of places. So I think that one of the, the things that I try to do is do lots of public communication and public outreach specifically around my research so that we can like raise awareness of the problems that are happening. And then the next thing is that sometimes we also go directly to government agencies uh, and present our research to them. So there are, there's one a uh, agency, NOAA, uh, N-O-A-A, -A, so the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They are um, responsible for a lot of research in our fields, a lot of research on smog chemistry and stuff like that. And they report directly to Congress. And, uh, and well, I guess technically they report to uh, the executive branch, but that's another way that our research gets out there. Uh, sorry, I see a question. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask, um, like, for careers in that field, um, are they mostly private organizations that are funding the research, Covenant. or is it um, government? <laughs> so, um, so very. There's almost no private funding for this, uh, and that's because air pollution doesn't make money. Um, <laughs> which is uh, a really, you know, big problem for why it's not really publicized very much. Um, it, it, I'm going to editorialize a little bit here. I'm going to air a little bit of my frustrations <laughs> because this question brings it up uh, a bit, which is that, um, you know, air pollution, like I said, it doesn't make money. It's things that companies want to try to avoid having to deal with in general. So if you look at large um, oil uh, companies, if you look at um, coal operations or fracking operations, um, they tend to not want to have the science be presented because it poses a direct um, threat to their profits. And that's understandable uh, because you know, fossil fuels are contributing to smog and contributing to these negative health effects that we talked about. Um, and so it's really up to the government agencies uh, to, to fund this research and to, to work for this. So there's not a lot of private work that goes into it. There's some, but most of the private work is focused on things like geoengineering um, mm -hmm. or, or uh, things like air quality monitoring. So you can get like, uh, there was some company, I think it's called Purple. Uh, they make these personal air quality monitors. I don't recommend that any of you get them. <laughs> they're, they're really bad. They yeah. are not accurate. Well, I believe I remember that a few years ago, maybe even last year, people were selling air from the, this, is the air from Canada to people in China because the air is so bad. Like people would buy, open a can of air and inhale it. And then, um, so yeah. Josh, we have about eight minutes left because our students have classes at 11. Um, do sure. you think you might have time to show us very quickly what your lab is like? I, I haven't gotten a notification. I, I'm um, sorry about that. That would be I, fine too. Yes. We have plenty of other questions to ask you. <laughs> that would be fine. Okay, yeah. No, I, I, I really wish that I could, but there's about 10 people in there right now. All moving. Oh, I see. Right, right, right. right. That's okay. Oh. Um, um, yeah. 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 So this is this is another. Uh, this is actually a really important area too, which is like not directly related to the science of what I do, but it is related to why I do the science. Um, which is there's a lot of environmental injustice that is uh, going on, uh, especially in generally uh, around lower income areas, because th those are areas where. Uh, factories tend to be located, power plants tend to be located, and where emissions are, are really bad. So uh, air pollution tends to affect uh, people who, one, are generally not responsible for causing as much air pollution as exists, 
and two, people who can't deal with the air pollution um, because uh, of general lack of um, government help or government preparedness or uh, lack of financial ability. And so in certain, especially in places like, um, uh, like, well, like a place that you just mentioned where there's a factory nearby, there really should be a lot more information given to residents that, you know, the air is not so great right here and it's because of this. And uh, there needs to be a lot more raising of public awareness to try to tackle these issues because right now air pollution is not very visible primarily because it doesn't affect most people who have power. It tends to affect people who are not able to affect uh, the change that is needed. So um, I, I just want to uh, take permission to leave today because sure. I, I have a class at 11. <laughs> oh, yeah. There before 11. So I'm going to email you to say thank you. We really appreciate you. So, thank you, Atani. She, she has a class. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. I think I have thank another you. question. Nice. Do you guys have another question? No. I think my last question is I know that. Um, some of the students here will want to go to graduate school when they graduate. Um, so other than, it sounds really glamorous that, you know, one of your former classmates could travel around the world for free, right? <laughs> Doing research, collecting <laughs> air. Um, yeah. What do you like so much about your field or like, the research? Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah. well, okay. So I'll just, <laughs> I, I want to start off by saying grad school is not, exactly glamorous. Um, we do get to travel, um, you know, to do field research and, and stuff like that. But um, it, it's, it, it's a lot of good work. Um, so what I love about it and why, so I, I did my undergrad in, in chemical engineering. Uh, a lot of my friends went into the oil and gas industry. And uh, over the course of, of my, my college and, and the classes that I took, I became more and more interested in environmental science and and because I really think that um, that's one of the biggest if not the biggest challenge uh, that we have right now facing the whole world is uh, environmental problems and so that's really the passion that drives me towards my research um, I am also I love chemistry I'm like a huge chemistry nerd talk about chemistry all day just talked with y'all and I loved it um, and it's uh, it's something that I, I think that if you're going to go to grad school, which is awesome, uh, I think you should really be passionate about what you want to, to learn uh, and what you want to research because that's really what uh, is going to drive you. Research is like 90% failure, 5% success, and 5% what the hell just happened. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of like setbacks and a lot of uh, troubleshooting and all of that, but to keep like the ultimate goal in mind is is really important. And then to, you know, be able to actually do this research and like advance the state of human knowledge is something that I think is um, a really exciting goal to have. Uh, and that's, that's what my goal is. So I, I, I just want to be able to do that. And then share my passion, my enthusiasm with other people, and uh, also to, to teach. I, you know, all of that is, is really what I want to do. So that's why I want to stay in academia. Thank you so much. We certainly can hear uh, your passion like, from your, your presentation. And thank you so much for your time. Do you guys have one last minute question or no? Thank you so much. Um, we have recorded everything. I'm going to share you know, the, the, the session with my other students. Um, yeah, we will be in touch. Thank you, Josh. Great, thank you. It's nice meeting y'all. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.